are live. Welcome to 94, 1994's Scanners 2 Review and Thoughts, The New Order. So, whether you celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, Ramadan, Kwanzaa, anything else religious or anything non-religious, I wish you and the people that you care about happy holidays. I will not be doing a holiday-related movie, but as a spe special holiday treat, I will be doing a throwback to my old style of doing videos. So, yeah, I am going to tear apart a bad movie. So, yeah, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I really found to be average. I didn't quite hate it. There was enough competency on display, but very average. And not just as a, as a sequel to a really excellent movie. This video will have a lot of jokes, and I there's not going to be a lot of serious topics in this, I don't think. So if you're looking for a review that talks about the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies because of that, it's that it's not that much fun to watch day, and or it's different from the first movie, so it sucks. Whether you agree with that assessment, this is not that review. And yeah, so I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review, where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so, hold up an index finger. Until I'm done with the spoilers, you can mute and skip, it and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Let's see. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for the first movie. As soon as I end the review itself, I am, you know, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So, let's see. That brings us... Yeah, so the movie is rated R, and so is the video. Yeah, the movie's rated R for strong violence and graphic sci-fi action. Now, if you do love this film and or hate the first one, that's perfectly fine. I'm not trying to attack you personally, just the movie. And that brings us to... Right, and the this I got this on sale. I paid almost nothing for this, so the the tone of this video is not based on you know I don't feel like I wasted money or time on this. So let's see. Yeah, so plot. This is basically about a young scanner called David something or other, and he, like, he barely knew he was a scanner, but he th th learns it and realizes that he might really be able to, you know, to change things. And it seems like the perfect time for that, because the city he lives in is going through this massive crime wave, which was something people were dealing with in the mid 90s and yeah so according to the mdb more like this list this is yeah not a big surprise this is compared to the third scanners movie scanner cup 2 scanner cup 1 and the first scanners movie also ghoulies go to college the outing ghoulies two scanner double gainers okay Cemetery of Terror, Transfers 3, and Killer's Delight. I just gotta check. Is that what I think? And it is loading. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Oh. Ah. Uh, interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, so, the, yeah, so, a big part of why I'm doing this video is, you know, yeah, I really, really love the first movie, and I wanted to see, you know, I had been warned about the sequels, but I was too curious to not, so, yeah, um, I'm, you know, doing this one. I will also be doing the other one, but that's like a month away, I think. You know, I'm trying not to 
burn out on the same series and, and such. Um, but yeah, uh, will not be doing the Scanner Cop movies. I have not been able to find any, you know, yeah, I've gone to a number of websites. Nobody sells them here. So yeah, can't do them. And it's not on, you know, neither of them are on Disney Plus. That would also be a, an option, but it's not. And let's see. So that brings us to the writing. So, yeah, uh, the writer's name B.J. Nelson, which is appropriate because his work sucks. And, yeah, he, he wrote both of these proper sequels. I think Scanner Cop 1 and 2 are considered spin-offs, technically. Uh, he also wrote a movie called Dirt Merchant from 99, Orion's Key from 96, and Lone Wolf McQuaid from 83. That is a title. He wrote an episode of Renegade. Um, yeah, he produced some of... Oh, and he yeah, he produced one movie that he did not himself write called Bounty Tracker. He also directed Dirt Merchant. Okay, I'm just very, very quickly going to look at what... So, oh boy, 4.2 out of 10. A slacker turns PI solves a rock star's murder. Uh, oh wow, okay. It features David Faustino, Jenna Jameson. Wow, okay. Anthony Michael Hall in one, oh, Breon James, Julie Benz. But some of what Julie Benz did before Dexter is not great, so yeah. But yeah, he he wrote, directed. I th did he also produce? Uh, yeah. So maybe that was his big dream project, and it was the last thing. You know, he has not written directed or produced since so there's some chance that it is not a particularly good movie uh yeah i saw one critic point out that this movie may as well not be connected to the first one and i'd have to 100 percent agree it's yeah uh yeah the uh, right right in case you haven't watched the video my you know in case you know nothing about scanners scanners are human beings with Tele yeah, psychic ability. Telepathic, telekinetic, sometimes pyrokinetic. You know, they can make things happen with their mind. And yeah, like, it's such a... Like, the first movie makes an impression, and this one just, like, there's really not... It, it is technically connected to the first one. There is a plot thread that ties it to the first movie. But yeah, you could easily take that out. I, I, I mean... Yeah, I think basically just they they really wanted people to think it had much more to do with the first one. So they, you know, one of the things I love about the first movie is that it actually explores the life of a scanner. They are defined by their psychic powers. You know, there's one person who's an artist who hides away from people and makes art to deal with the, the trauma of always hearing other people's thoughts you know there are some who think that they should you know they, they believe in like scanner supremacy they think scanners should rule regular people and you, you know you have i don't think i want to give too much more away but there are you know over the course of the first movie you meet a number of scanners and many of them have thought of different things Things that can help, you know, yeah, ways to cope with their condition, which, you know, some of them consider it a curse, some consider it a gift. You know, either way, it makes them very different. It makes it difficult for them to lead a normal life. And various of them have taken up, you know, yeah, some of them have taken up causes. Some of them just basically try to hide and live not a normal life, but a controlled life. You know, it's it's 
fascinating. Like, you don't have to like the movie, but I think... I would, I would find it hard to believe that nobody thinks that, that there's anybody out there who looks at all the different, you know, different ideas in the first movie of how to, to cope with living with, I mean, you could say it is a metaphor for a, a mental, I don't know if disability is the, but, but a mental, di you know, a diagnosis, you know, like you could view it as just a metaphor for being on the spectrum, for example, um, so yeah, it's it's you don't have to like it. I know a lot of people don't think that. I'm not saying it's Cronenberg's very best work, you know, but it has ideas, and this movie is just not interested in, in it, interested in exploring scanners. Like in this one, you know, yeah. So the first movie explores scanners. This one just features them, like. You could easily rewrite this movie to, instead of, like, psychic powers, maybe they have a, some sort of scientific, you know, futuristic scientific device. You know, in, instead of, like, close-ups of people doing weird faces as they're trying to influence you. You know, no, you could just have it be, you know, oh, they've got, like, a weird device on their wrist. And, like... Every, you know, each time they use it, you you get like a close up of someone like turning, a, a, you know, pressing buttons, that kind of thing. You know, you could have it be that they're humanoid aliens that that you know look so human that they could. It has nothing to do with just yeah. And and honestly, if it did at least do that, even if it did a bad job of it, I could respect that. I, but the. It doesn't feel like this was made by people who thought the first was a good movie. It feels like it was made by people who thought the first movie would be easy to make a crowd-pleasing sequel to. Like, yeah, for sure, there are some people who... I, I read a bunch of reviews of people who like this movie better than the first. And peace be with that. That's perfectly fine. I'm just saying, you could, like, this is like... The, uh, yeah, yeah, in some ways, this is like one of the bad X-Men sequels. You know, this is somewhat like The Last Stand, for example. You know, yeah, technically, it's in there. There's stuff about how it... it def okay, uh, yes, that, that movie does significantly more with the, the concept, exploring the concept. But yeah, that one also, like, it's nowhere near as... Like, I'm... I get why some people really don't like, and some people even seem to hate, the first X-Men movie from 2000. That's, you know, that's fine. I respect that. We can have, you know, we can have different opinions on stuff. You have the wrong opinion on that movie. I have, I'm kidding. Anyway, that movie, if you just look at the writing, I'll grant that there are issues with the how it carries it out, but if you just look at the writing, just go scene by scene and notice the little, like, there are so many interesting things in there and it actually explores these things. And then you get, you know, with The Last Stand, I mean, technically you still have this thing, but it's so, like, it's not doing a good job of exploring it. And this movie doesn't seem interested at all in exploring, like, you know, like I said, it could easily just be a device. It does the fact that they're that it affects their regular lives is such an afterthought in this movie that it might as well be that like yeah yeah you know some of them like they they struggle to return to a normal life. You could just have it be that the device like has a strain on on them as well or something. The fact that they were born this way. Just, which is such a big part of the first one. They're, they're born with this thing. They have to figure out how to live with it. And then in this one, like, for a while, the, the protagonist barely even knows. Like, okay, you know, when he was a kid, he could do things. But he didn't realize that it was this big thing. He wasn't... the fir In the first movie, the protagonist, Cameron, is basically... Like, his, his his entire life has been ruined by this. Since he was a child, his life has been completely 
at the mercy of these powers. And then in this one, like, the protagonist is much more well-adjusted. Like, they, they say at the start that, oh, you know, he used to live out in the country and... Uh, countryside. Now he's moved into the city and he's been there for three weeks. He doesn't like it that much. But that's like... I feel like the idea of him being from the country, countryside. I feel like that was their way of explaining why he hasn't been completely overwhelmed by it. Like, you know, like how in the first movie it dominates their lives. You know, they, the, some of them manage to, to wrestle back some control, but if they don't, you know, it's a struggle. They have to work to, con and, and he's just like, well, there's a um, doop doo doo nothing much. And like, okay, if he's been in the countryside his, you know, most of his life, he's like 20 something. I guess that he hasn't been exposed to a lot of people in a single place and their minds would like overwhelm him. Okay. Why has it been three weeks without him being completely overwhelmed, though? Like, you f I, f I feel like if this was a proper sequel to the first movie, this would just... And, and again, I promise, if this was a good movie that just... I could forgive it for being a bad sequel, but it is just... It's a, it's a very average movie, and it is a very bad sequel. If this was a proper sequel to the first, then, like, within... Hours of getting into the city, he would be so overwhelmed, and he'd just go back to the countryside. Like that's the th that's why it has destroyed Cameron's life. He was born in the city. He's never. He doesn't. How would he get anywhere else? He has no contacts. No, nobody seems to to like him or respect him. He's he's essentially an unhoused individual with a with a you know mental health diagnosis. So. You know, and, and that was actually going into how people just, yeah. There are characters, but they tend to be archetypes. They're so stereotypical and bland and boring. Like, and the, the, there's, actually, I guess I'll cover that later in the video. But yeah, so, um, there are plot twists in this movie. Um, yeah, several of them are bad. I, I'm not sure I would say that there are too many or too few, but, like, there are twists in this where it's like, yeah, obviously, like, that... I'm not entirely 100% sure some of them are even supposed to be twists, but the movie kind of treats them like they're supposed to be twists. Like, it's the, oh no, and it's like, we knew that. We've we've seen it already. Like I, I was was the twist that now this character figured it out. Like it it can work to have the audience knowing more than care than, than the protagonist, but you gotta make it. You you gotta handle that very carefully. And this really doesn't. Um. Yeah. There's at least one twist near the end where I was like, "What is even the point? Like that changes absolutely nothing." It's just, yeah. Okay, so that brings us to the direction. So this was directed by Christian Duguay. And, okay, so he's, it, right, he, yeah, he directed something as recently as 2019. So thankfully, like, this didn't tank his career or anything. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he, he, he directs, um... Oh, actually, yeah, come to think of it, has he directed... Yeah, yeah, he has directed 12 theatrical movies, but he has 22 TV directing credits. He is more of a, a TV director, and he's really good at it. He directed all four episodes of the 2005 TV miniseries Human Trafficking, which I rank in 8 out of 10. It is... Excellent. Like, if at all you... Okay, by today's standards, I can... It's, I haven't watched it since, like, 2005. By today's standards, it's probably problematic and not quite up-to-date, you know. But for the time, it was very strong. 
and it's very clearly like you know obviously if you're gonna make a movie if you're gonna tell a story about human trafficking it's because you think it's disgusting and that really shines through in that one like it was just I'll, I'll grant actually yeah thinking about it, there it might at times have been a, a bit exploitative but for sure it's made by people who think human trafficking is disgusting if you didn't already th i don't know how you could i guess if you didn't know what human trafficking was you will definitely realize how disgusting it is based on that miniseries and just like yeah it's well worth like i'm not big on miniseries i prefer movies i was never bored during the entire miniseries and he directed both episodes of the Hitler, The Rise of Evil TV miniseries from 2003, which I also rank an 8 out of 10. Uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, a lot of stuff I don't know, so I can't really comment on. They made a Hitchhiker TV series? Huh. I'm, I'm still surprised they could get more than one movie out of that concept, but maybe it's a different Hitchhiker thing. Anyway... So yeah, um, of the of the twelve theatrical movies he has directed, ah, yeah, most of them I do. Oh right, yeah, he actually, yeah, he did. He directed one from this year, from twenty twenty two. So his career is still going. He directed the two thousand eight movie Boot Camp, which uh, it's hard to see, but I have it right up there. Um, so let's see. It's uh, what, what's her name again? Mila. Kunis, and, ah, uh, hold on, I'll find it really quickly, here we go, Gregory Smith, um, the, the piano playing kid from, wow, I can't, now I don't, Everwood, that's right, Ephraim Brown from Everwood, and, yeah, like, it's not, the best movie ever made, but it works for what it is. You know, I, I give it a 6 out of 10. I've done a review on, on that specific one where I talk about, you know, what I what I like and dislike about it. So I'm not going to get too much into it here. He directed Screamers, which at some point I'm probably going to watch because I am trying to watch everything that is adapted from a... Um, can't believe I blanking on his name. Philip K. Dick. Um, the the yeah, and he it, yeah, it's based on his short story Second Variety, which is actually one of my favorites. I gotta watch that at some point. Um, oh, written by Dan O'Bannon of Alien Fame. Very nice. Uh, yeah, let's see. He uh, there we go. And yeah, he directed Live Wire from. 1992, which I also rank a 6 out of 10. It's fine. I think, and, and right, and he, in addition to this, he did also direct the third movie, so the second sequel. So I am going to briefly rank, yeah. So, worst to best of things I've seen him direct other than this one. Live Wire, Boot Camp, Hitler, and Human Trafficking. And, yeah, honestly... In my experience, he is only as good as his script. Good script, good movie. Bad script, bad movie. And yeah, um, it's too bad. But but for sure, like if if you don't really care about the the if if you just want a movie where scanners be scanning, yeah, you know, um, B J Nelson makes sure there's scanner activity every so often. And Christian Duguay makes it look pretty good for, you know, relatively low budget. Now, in this movie, the scanners have some new psychic abilities. Some, critic, some critics really dislike that it's stuff that we didn't see in the first one. And some of the stuff seems less telepathic. And, you know, let's see. Yeah, in, you know, in the first one, it seems more telepathic and less tele... No, actually, yeah, come to think, there is some telekinesis in the... F or wait, I guess the... the um, that's the thing, like, in the first one, Cameron will make someone fly backwards. Now, is that telekinesis? Is he lifting their body? Or is it telepathy? He's making their body... Yeah. 
anyway, you know, in, in the first one, you know, it's not only mind reading and mind control as telepathy is frequently depicted. Now, yeah, that by itself, I, th I think it's okay to have something new in a sequel and not necessarily explain it. You know, these are not the same scanners. However, the thing that some critics pointed out that also bothers me is how silly the new ones are. And some of them don't feel useful, but rather just like the special effects team were showing off, which, you know, I, I can respect. The, I, I think special effects are, are underrated. And special effects people are way too often not, you know, people talk about, oh, I really love that movie. And then they talk about, you know, the writer and the director. But what they really love when you when you ask them to define what exactly was you love, it's the, you know, with a lot of 80s and 90s horror movies, it's the effects, you know. And I'm not saying, for sure, there were also some really excellent ones. You know, I still stand by the... Nightmare on Elm Street films are excellent beyond the effects. Like, you can sit down and just, you know, several of the DVDs, you can plug in, yeah, you can, you can you know, put it in the in the player, and there's uh, something in the menu called Jump to a Kill, so if you just want to watch them, you know. But they are actually good movies, not all of them, but, you know, again, the, the uh, I think the sixth and the remake are the only bad Nightmare on Elm Street movies. You know, they they are good beyond the effects, but, you know, something like Friday the 13th, let's be honest, it's the it's the effects. Um, let's see. So, yes. Critic quote. Um, in his first theatrical release, Christian Duguay does a passable job with... Oh, that's right. This, yeah, this was actually his first theatrical... So, yeah, people like, you know, it was popular enough that he was able to build a... You know, he, yeah, he got a career after, yeah, because Livewire was the year after, you know, both of, both Scanners 2 and 3 came out in 1991, and 1992 he was already directing again, and 95, 97, 2000, yeah, the, yeah, after Boot Camp it was five years before he released, but other than that, yeah, largely he's, he's, you know, been, been pretty active. Uh, let's see, um, yeah, passable job, though the film shows relatively little of the craftsmanship he was to demonstrate later in Live Wire. And this guy says, okay, I think he meant to say infinitely, but he wrote indefinitely, which is not how that works. But yeah, uh, the infinitely better streamers. Yeah. It's fine. I mess up stuff like that sometimes, too. For a cheap B-film, Scanners 2 is competently made, tight in both style and narrative structure. And that's very true. Um, like, you know, yeah, average. But as I watched, like, I was never... It never loses the plot. It's never, like... You know, not, th there's never really anything that's just, like... Yeah, it's still in. Um, yeah, there's never anything in it where it just completely loses the, the, like, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the opening of this features, oh, did I, oh, uh, hold on. Oh, right, it would be this one. Wow, yeah. The opening shot is of the city and multiple contextless screams. See, when I watched the trailer, I was like, what an uncontext shown scream. I wonder if it'll have, you know, uh, presumably it has context in the movie. And like, okay, eventually it does, but I think it was like 40 seconds between the first scream and the actual explanation and it just, yeah, I don't know. Um, also, because it's just, it's this short shot of someone's, like, yeah, if you've watched the trailer but not the movie, you probably know what shot I'm talking about already. You know, just open mouth. Ah, and then it fades, and then we see some more of the city. And, if, you know, a little later, we get another shot of the screaming. And then, finally, we meet the guy and see what's going on there. And... Based on the screaming, I really don't understand 
why he then does what he then does. But okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but if it's what came before, uh, the ending is fine, I guess. There's some... I mean, certainly I will say the climax is pretty satisfying. Uh, you know, it is legitimately... Yeah, you know, they, they went into this movie knowing that people were going to expect... A certain, you know, the the climax of the first movie is not necessarily the most like effect wise. It's it's strong, but it, yeah, I already mentioned I'm I'm spoiling the the first movie. The climax of the first one is not the biggest action set piece in the movie, but it is the most personal. You know, basically action scene in, in the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, because Cameron learns, you know, and, and I'll grant, you know, should he maybe, should it have been clear that they were brothers before just the end? But it does have an emotional impact, you know. Um, it's not just saying it so that it is, you know, the the... Yeah, the lines at the end of the movie, before the fight, do have an emotional impact. Um, let's see. And and it really, it, it does a good job of basically filling in, like, we, we understood why I'm going to have to look up. Uh, here we go. Um, the... Michael Ironside character, Daryl Revick. You know, we basically know why he's doing what he's doing. But the ending with him, you know, he explains some things and, you know, you understand it even more. It, it really, like, yeah, it fills in the last little bit and, yeah. But, yeah, uh, no Deus Ex Machina, no other convenient writing to the ending of this movie. The ending titles have this really cheesy pop song playing over, but yeah. Um, and and yeah, the end credits, there's not really any reason to watch. It's just text on a, you know, scrolling text on black background. That brings us to the characters. So, let's see. Yeah, David Hewlett plays David Kellum, and he is our lead. Now, let's see. Okay, so yeah, there, there's one critic here who says, uh, so I, yeah, I don't agree with this, but some people feel this way. As unobtrusive and lacking in personality as the hero David Kellum is, he is still much more interesting and likable than the talentless Stephen Lack who almost ruined Cronenberg's film with his lackluster portrayal of the good scanner. Now, over the course of my video of the, the first scanner movie, where I talk about the first scanner movie, I changed opinion on, I, uh, you know, so, yeah, I do think Stephen Lack did a good job. He, it's, it's a, you know, basically he doesn't have a proper self, Cameron doesn't, so, yeah, he doesn't, he's not the most charismatic, or, yeah. And yeah, like here, it just, the, the, the thing with Cameron is, over the course of the movie, he does things that you maybe sit back and you're like, is that the right thing to do? Is, is that, I'm not sure that's okay. And then in this movie, it's basically just like, there are things he does that are on the extreme side, but the movie clearly wants us to think that he's right for doing them. So, it's just, like, the, yeah, you know, they, they took away all the interesting things from the first movie. Like, the only thing that this movie has, that the first also did, is that, you know, they have these psychic powers. That's basically, and it, I suppose, yeah, and both of them take place in this, you know, kind of dark and, and unpleasant city, but... In this one, there's a crime wave, where in the first one, you know, there are problems, but not to... The, yeah. That's the thing. Like, the, the whole crime wave thing, you could basically... Uh, in, in the... In the... 
right, I think I'm just gonna really quickly get this. I will, there we go. Um, yeah, so, the, the, um, the things that challenged the audience in the first movie are gone. You know, the fact that, like, because, yeah, really, by the end of it, like, the only, re we, we learn, uh, might be at the end, actually, that we basically, it, it, close to the end, I think, we learn that the only reason that Daryl Revok is a threat is because of how he was treated by the company, the company that's now having Cameron kill him, you know, like, they're basically just cleaning up their own mess, they're not doing good, you know, they shouldn't have, they should have been more careful so that Daryl Revick didn't, and, and, yeah, you know, they just take other scanners and use them against him, you know, not really risking them, their own kind of, you know, so, so, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, Deborah Raffin as Julie Vale, and... Yvonne Ponton as Commander John Forrester. I'll admit, he was somewhat, like, there. there's something there to, to him, you know. I, not, not really in the writing, necessarily, but the guy really projects, you know. There's a, there's a, he's, he's, he's an entertaining character, if, if nothing else. Isabella Mejas plays Alice Leonardo, like the artist, not the Ninja Turtle, she says, which is just rampant anti-turtleism. And Raul Trujillo plays Peter Drac. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about his character, but I will say he really threw himself into it. Like, there is so much energy and passion in his performance. Like, there are times where he's not even, like, bouncing off the walls and energetic, but there's such intensity in his eyes, and just, yeah, he's, he's, the movie would be much worse without him. He, he was eminently watchable. Uh, let's see. Wow. Uh, is that really, yeah, yeah. Emily Eppy is just listed as reporter, even though she's really important to the plot, although we don't actually learn anything about her other than she's a reporter, I guess. So, yeah. But she's, like, she's incredibly important. You know, that's also, like, this movie... I don't know if it likes, hates, or just finds useful for storytelling purposes the press, because there are times in this where, like the press will repeat something, you know, say something into a camera, and someone will be watching the the newscast on TV and be like, oh, no. So it's like, I mean, it furthers the story. I can't argue with the... So, yeah. And, it, like, it's stuff that would be covered by the news. So, so yeah. I just... I feel like... I'd like to have more of an idea of if they think it's a good... Because there are times where I got the vibe... Yeah, actually, yeah, come to think of it, I guess by the end of this, basically we're supposed to take away that, you know, news reporters can be a force for good or a force for bad. It really depends on the situation. So, yeah, okay, fair enough. I talked myself into liking it. Uh, let's see, uh, yeah, so this is definitely one of those where, like, the, the, it features women, but the women are not particularly, like, honestly, basically, the female characters in this could largely be gender swapped, and there's, like, you know, some of them are in straight relationships, which would then become gay relationships, obviously, unless you gender swap the other person as well. But that's, you know, ideally you'll want some definition, like several of them are like devoted to their partner, which you could still have if they were gay or if the other, it just, there's not really anything, yeah, the first movie 
there are little things that are like, oh, that's because she's a, a woman and a scanner or a woman who can't scan in a world of scanners, you know, there's, there's little things. And in this one, just honestly, I would be very surprised if there's any reason for there to be women in this movie at all, other than, well, if the the women were gender swapped and the men weren't, then you'd have gay relationships, and some people really don't like that. They might not want to watch the movie if there were gay relationships in it, so, you know, that's basically it. And, like, you know, there's, um, the mayor is a woman, which you might think, oh, so she's gonna be, like, focused on, like, maybe she's, like, a feminist, or she's, you know, focused on women's issues. I, I realize that some, you know, yeah, she's basically, she's the, like, in real life, she is one of those, you know, she's, she's a, a woman who has power who's not really interested in helping women. It's just she realizes, well, you know, these days, some people want to vote for a woman, so I'll do the bad things that my, you know, it's, to be fair, I don't know if she's a Democrat, but it it really, I really got the sense of, like, a, a Democrat, you know, yeah. One of these, you know, I, um, I suppose I can't actually give any real-life examples without, like, triggering the, the, you know, the conservatives who hate them because they're a woman, so... Yeah, I, you know, you, you probably can guess who I'm talking about. There are a couple of very prominent examples. So, yeah, the the dialogue... <sighs> yeah, the IMDb quote section has four entries, and for this movie, all four of them are good. And, yeah, it's just, like, there's a lot in this movie where characters will say something so that the audience can can, you know, appreciate it. It's not... It doesn't come up naturally. Like, one of the first scenes, you have two people who've been working together for a long time, and one of them says, you can't do that, that doesn't work. And it's like, have you never had this conversation before? You've been working together for a while. One of you wants to do one thing, the other wants to do another. And it's like, because really, you could, you could just have their first scene be... That the the um, to be fair, there is there is a story reason. I just it just feels like ideally you don't want a scene looking to the audience like it's just the way it is, simply because the the writer needed to get something across. Like you want him to be like organic and natural, you know. So yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, some very clunky exposition and just, it's especially like when they, when it is explained to David what a scanner is and that he is one, like he, I think it's not long after he says, well, you know, I mean, as a kid, yeah, I could read people's minds and move things with my mind, but I didn't know I was a scanner, which is like, really? Like, that was actually a thi- I don't- I, I really don't think that what he says is, I didn't know there was such a thing as scanners, because apparently that it, it just- yeah. Which is also like, did it really not come out? Because this, this movie is set in a world where the first movie happened. Like, I can appreciate that. It, like, and in the first movie, there are people who know. Like, most of them work for the company that, you know. But, yeah, in this one, it, it, like, some of the scanning that happened in the first movie, like, did they really, did that, like, one of the scanning... Um, what, yeah, one of the results of scanning was that this um, computer, um, yeah, they were they were working with something with computers. They were working with computers. It blows up. Did people not hear about that? Like, it's just there was also a gas station. Or wait, did it, the, the gas station blow up, or did the 
phone wires. I, ah, yeah, it's been a little. I haven't watched this since I did the video on the first one. But yeah, it really is like, why did how how did no one hear about this? Because apparently, yeah, yeah. At times in this, at least one character claims to the press that scanners are a myth. How could that still be? Like, just, yeah. Like, even if you want to say, oh, they, they suppressed the story. How? How did they suppress that many separate incidents? Just, yeah. Anyway, that brings us to the cinematography handled by DP Rodney Gibbons, who has... 10 TV credits Let's see, and 7 theatrical credits and let's see um, he did Screamers after this one also with Christian Duguay so you know it's possible that they liked working together he did the original My Bloody Valentine uh, he was director of photography on the original My Bloody Valentine, which I hear is better. I've, I've only watched the, the more recent one. For sure, like, there's interesting camera work in this. Like, at the end of the day, if you don't do something interesting with the camera, you know, the scanning... Like, obviously, there's effects to it, but you kind of have to start by showing the person, like, focusing. And, yeah, you're either, like... Well, actually, yeah, the, the, um, yeah, I'll talk about the sound design a little later, but, yeah, in, you know, you can do something interesting with the camera or, 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 you know, or sound design, otherwise you just have characters, like, looking intently and, and that can, you know, that by itself is not going to sustain an entire, you know, theatrical running time, so... Yeah, the, there's times where the camera will go really wonky to to get... Yeah. Believe it or not, that was not an intentional Willy Wonka reference. But yeah, the, the camera will go all screwy and yeah, it works. Like, I've seen movies where, you know, they go really out there with camera work and it's just like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. That was a that was a bad idea. That did not have the effect you intended. And that's not really the case here. So, yeah. So, the editing is handled by Yves Langlois, who has 54 credits as movie editor, 40 as TV editor. And so let's see. I think I think this is the... Right, he, he edited both of the sequels. He also edited Screamers. So, yeah. Duguay has a... You know, brought back the team for, for Screamers. He put the band back together. And, yeah. Um, I've already criticized the, the dialogue. Like... The editing, like, there's no, there's no scene that really goes on. Okay, maybe one of the first is, is a, yeah, yeah. I already mentioned that there's an issue with, like, scanning powers being used weirdly. But other than that, like, yeah, I, I couldn't really point to a scene in this that should be trimmed or removed for entirely, removed entirely, you know, like, you know, if, if you... If you very rarely watch badly told movies, then you might not appreciate it is difficult to keep it going. Like, basically, every scene has to ideally further the plot and or develop characters. You know, you don't really want there to be any scenes that are just there because they thought it would be a cool scene or they liked this character and they wanted him to do this or that. You know, no, ideally, you want it to have it... and. Yeah, you know, by and large, like, there, there are scenes in this that are just there to show off scanner powers, but other than that, and, and not many, like, it doesn't go completely nuts with it. Which, let's be honest, a number of 80s and 90s horror movies, you know, after a while, it's just, wow, that's, that certainly is a lot of scenes of, 
the killer killing someone is is anything gonna happen other than that is there gonna be anything and and again that's one of the things i really appreciate about the nightmare on elm street scenes you know they actually like yeah it's not a spoiler to say that from very early on i guess in in each of the movies there's clearly something going on which you know a number of slasher movies it's only at the very end of the movie that people, you know, most of the movie, like, if someone realizes, oh, there's a killer, they get killed right after without telling someone who survives the scene. So it's just scene after scene of people dying. It's much harder to write a, a horror movie where people know that something is going on and are trying to avoid it. That brings us... Yeah, so... The yeah, um, the first movie, the first Scanners, is estimated to have cost four million and a one hundred thousand Canadian dollars, and this one had a budget of five million. So, you know, they were expecting that it would, and I haven't been able to find. Um, let's see, numbers for how much it made. But the first one apparently made $14,225,876. So, yeah, you know, you can see why they made... Yeah, it's definitely... The first Scanners is perhaps the most franchisable uh, Cronenberg movie. You know, arguably The Fly is also really high up there, but ultimately... Yeah, Scanners is probably the single most franchisable, so no wonder that, you know, he didn't have anything directly to do with any of them, but they did manage to make four movies other than that first one that he did make. So, yeah, um, and you can understand why. They, they, they knew that there was an audience for a sequel, so, yeah, slightly higher budget, but still a fairly low, you know, five million for 1991. As not, as not a lot. That is, um, so yeah, that, and, you know, the, the, ultimately I don't know with 100% certainty who deserves uh, the credit or the blame, but someone working on this made sure that it's right there on screen, you know, it, it was with the first one as well, but there are definitely movies that, don't really, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't spend a huge amount on locations or getting big names or these kinds of things. It went to the, you know, the, the, yeah, a lot of it probably went to the effects, honestly. There's some pretty, yeah, and, and just, yeah, they, they made sure that the movie looks good, you know, honestly, this could easily have been a direct-to-video movie, but it looks better than a lot of direct-to-video movies I've I've seen. You know, again, like it is it is a B movie. It has no aspirations above that. It's not trying to change the world, but it you know at the end of the day, like when you're making a B movie, and sometimes it depends on budget. Sometimes you have no choice, but for a number of people, it's like. We can make an effort and make it look good and make people want to watch it again, or we can just coast and, and figure, well, people will watch a movie like this. So, but yeah, this was shot in Montreal and it was in 89 and they didn't get it out until 91. Okay. Uh, let's see the, yeah. So the action scenes are, are, For the the budget and and such, not half bad. Uh, you know there are, you know some scenes have guns. There's some chasing, obviously use of of scanner powers, and just yeah, um, the guns. There's a sense of threat to them that sometimes movies with guns don't have, which you know. At that point, why even have guns in your movie if, if it's not going to look... Un unless you want to make it clear that, oh, this 
this other thing is much better than guns, you know, then you, but otherwise it's like, it's kind of pointless without, but some people don't really know how to deal with it. Um, yeah, the scanners come across as legitimately skilled and dangerous. Like, you understand why, you know, like, in, in a... One of the first lines is, I don't want a scanner war. And you can understand why people would be afraid of scanners. Like, they are very capable. It is, it is not small beans what they are able to do with their psychic powers. And, yeah, um, decent variety to, to the action scenes also. So, yeah, the, overall the action scenes in the first one are better, but... This one isn't that far behind, considering how much of a B-movie it is. So, the score was composed by Marty Simon. And, okay, so there's technically 16 theatrical movie credits, but a couple of them are just... Oh, okay, maybe, yeah, one of them is a music video. So, 15 movies from 1987 to, to, through... 20, uh, oh, right, that's the music video. 2000 was the last... And, yeah, he did the music for both Scanner's sequels. And, yeah, um, it's good. I wouldn't say it's, like, amazing, but it gets the job done. You know, there, there's a, a number of scenes where it's supposed to get your pulse pounding, and it does pretty fine at that. There's tender scenes and that is obviously scored significantly differently so yeah and let's see yeah so ultimately i don't have a lot to say about the sound design it's just it's not as good as in the first one and that really is too bad I, again like if if you like this movie and you really don't like the first movie just watch one or two of the scanner scenes in the first one and then compare it to this and just it's not yeah um that brings us to yeah so this is an hour and 37 minutes long without end credits and 40 with them and like i said there's not really you know if you're enjoying the music or you want to you know some some people feel like oh i should you know people worked hard on this movie i want to give it a um yeah what's the word i've um You know, yeah, I, I want to let the names run as, as a sign of respect for the, you know. Um, I would say, yeah, if, you know, if you give it ba basically the first half hour, if you're not interested in what happens after that, you might as well turn it off. By, by then, it should have piqued your interest. And if it's not, if it hasn't yet, it's it might not. So, the... Yeah, um, the best element, at the end of the day, I can't deny, scanner action is still fun, even if it's not, yeah. The worst aspect is that it just has no interest in the, the exploring what is it like to live as a scanner. The worst thing, right, and I do think that's a big deal. You know, not if you just want to enjoy it, but I think it's a big deal for a, for a sequel to, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a huge... There's not that many times, that many individual cases where you can say a sequel to a David Cronenberg movie. You know, he doesn't make sequels and he doesn't make very many movies that are mainstream enough that other people would want to make sequels to them. You know, there's two sequels to the Scanners, there's one sequel to The Fly... You know, that's it. Other than that, you know, and, and yes, I am aware that apparently he did, at least for a while, want to make a sequel to Eastern Promises. But, yeah, you know, if you're gonna make a sequel to a, a Cronenberg movie, you know, but yeah, it's it's enjoyable enough. It's, it's a bit like with First Blood Parts 1 and Part 2, or the first two Rambo movies, for those... 
unfamiliar with the nomenclature, the first movie is amazing and really makes you think and explores someone that a lot of people don't, didn't at the time have a very high opinion of. And then the after that, it's just action, you know, B-movie action. But it's decently enough made. It's not boring, you know, so yeah. The worst thing, according to others, is that it is too silly. And for sure, that is, uh, yeah, that is an issue. The thing I was most worried about was that it would just be a cash-in and, yeah, the movie lived down to my expectations. I was most looking forward to the villain and, ah, the movie just barely got to my expectations. You know, nobody should have to follow up Michael Ironside. That's just not, you're, you're not going to win that. That's just not, you're, you're throwing the towel before you even go step into the ring. You're not going to win. Now, the, the trailer does give too much away, but also gives you a decent enough idea of what the movie is like. Um, I guess the, the trailer is an enjoyable enough watch if you like trailers from the period. And the cover and poster also give too much away, but to be fair, like, unlike with, you know, the first one, it's like, you, you look at it, it's like, wow, that's... You know, it's like, if you, I guess you don't necessarily know if you haven't, but the first, the cover of the first movie gives away the ending. You know, it, it shows one of the last shots in the movie. And since you can clearly identify Michael Ironside, you know, for f up until the end of the movie, you know, if you looked at the cover and, you know, let's be honest, that's probably what got a lot of asses and seats in the theater. You know, you're sitting there and like... Hasn't happened yet. Hasn't happened yet. You know, with this one, the head's completely blown up, so you can't tell who it is. So you don't know. You just know that someone's head is going to blow up. And honestly, you know, I mean, that that might as well be the the that might as well be the title or subtitle. Like, you know, instead of writing scanners, they might as well just have called it. We're going to blow up at least one head again. And, yeah, there is not a lot here on YouTube that deals with this movie. I found four clips, the one trailer, a TV spot, music video, fan one, five renew review analysis videos, and that's it. So, yeah, not very many people still care about this movie, and I can understand why. So, on Rotten Tomatoes, it has 17% based on three... Oh, hold on. Actually, yeah. It has so few reviews that it doesn't even have a rating. The the 17%, that's the audience rating. There's only three critic reviews. And, yeah, 17%, and there's over a 1,000 ratings. The average rating was 2.5 out of 5, making it rotten. It was, like, for something... The, if the average rating is 3.5 or higher, you know, that means that it's fresh. You know, that is the... Yeah. But yeah. It's not that just a few people voted on it. No. People did not like this movie. The the people who did vote. You know, so so yeah. Of the... Of the 17,000... Of the... Wow. Of the 1,000. Let's see. For it to be 17%, I guess that means... See, if it was 100 votes, it would have to be 17% who voted that. 17 people who voted that. But if it's even less... I'm bad at math. Uh, moving on. So, on... Oh, right. It's not even on Metacritic, I think. It's not on Metacritic at all. And on YouTube, there are only 22 user reviews. You know, normally I read the top voted 100, but there's so few. And, uh, yeah, briefly, the, the votes for those 22 reviews. Um, one of them gave it a 2 out of 10. One gave it a 3. Two gave it a 4. One gave it a 5. Five gave it a 6. Three gave it a 7. Three gave it an 8. No one gave it a 9. Two people gave it a 10. Fair enough, they must have really liked it. 
But yeah, so that's... Uh, yeah, I guess that is more positives than negatives, isn't it? Between the, Yeah. Um, it has a 5.2 average on IMDb. Based on 3,286 IMDb user votes. So... 26.3% gave it 5, 20, yeah, that was 26.3, 23.6 gave it 6, uh, let's see, 15.5 gave it 4, yeah, that makes sense, I'm not sure, I, I wouldn't give it less than 4, but I can understand 4, you know, like, if you look at the overall quality of the movie, it's probably around a 5, I can understand going to a 4, because of the silly stuff, the, the showing off. You know, again, like, I can appreciate if you, you know, if what you're showing off is dope as F, you know, some people like a show off. I can appreciate that. But this is a sequel to a movie that had things to say. And if you have things, you know, having things to say and showing off do not go together. Um, you know, like, the the... You might leave the first movie thinking, I never realized the kind of challenges you live with if you have a mental health diagnosis. You might leave this movie going, oh, wow, did you see that? And that's bad, in my opinion. 10.7% gave it 7, 6.5 gave it 3, 4.2 gave it 10, that's not nothing. Um, 3.4 gave it 1, 3.2 gave it 2, 1.5 gave it 9, so yeah, some people do really like it, but by and large, it is not that well received online. 33 of the 62 links worked and were in English for the IMDb External Reviews section, and this was nominated for a Saturn for Best Genre Video Release. Video. I thought it said theatrical. Anyway, so yeah, the special effects are good. Um, like obviously, if you know, you know, it's it's not like it's not gonna blow your mind, tee But yeah, it looks pretty good. It's it's just convincing enough, and some of it is very gnarly, like. You, you really, you know, and, and like I said in my review of the first one, the first one is not that dedicated to, like, cool body horror the way that, you know, for, for a Cronenberg movie, like, it's, you know, this one has more of, of, like, you know, people getting messed up by someone using scanner abilities on them. And, yeah, it was, it was very clear watching this movie that was something... That like that was a uh, that was a studio note or that someone definitely wanted more of that, and yeah, you know, for like early to mid nineties, fairly low budget, yeah, they're they're good, they're for that. There's some really good stunt work, um, some people flying through the air because scanners. Uh, the violence is also like, you know. There, there's definitely the. There are multiple times in this movie where the movie will make someone out to be just completely despicable, and then we get like someone killing them in a you know graphic fashion. So, yeah, that was definitely you know some people felt there was too little of that in the first one, and this you know yeah if that's the case for you, this is. Um, yeah, this was made for you. Um, so, the... Wait, is that... Okay, let me, let me real quick check to make sure that's actually... Um... Oh, that's right, yeah. Um, yeah, Outlaw Vern did a, a good review of, uh, of this movie. Um, 
you know what I think I'll I'll just I'll link it in the in the description box there we go um, yeah so uh, my version has uh, uh, my, my DVD has three trailers I forget what movies but I don't think any of them are scanner movies um, scanners movies I guess is the uh, some brief writing about the female lead some other work by lead male act it, yeah the lead male actor the director and that's it so you know by today's standards not something particularly impressive this was back when you know ooh, they have a trailer was still a selling point because there weren't you couldn't just go online now uh, you can apparently stream this on Tubi and yeah um, this is, I, I rate this five minds not at all blown out of ten. And, yeah. Um, so, yeah. The first movie is a lot better, to, to reiterate that. And, yeah, so, this is, yeah, ultimately, as, as silly as parts of Livewire are, yeah, I. Uh, this is the least impressive um, Christian Duguay movie that I've watched so far. Um, yeah, so, uh, before we get into the thoughts, I'm going to say um, I am really going to be talking very much about the writing. And lots of jokes, lots of criticism, so if that's what you're interested in. We enter the spoiler zone, the thoughts sections of the movie. So, starting with thoughts, ugh, notes taken while watching. Spoilers from here on out throughout the rest of the video. And, yeah. So, um, why is the scanner at the start going into the arcade if it makes him feel worse? Like... In the first film, the lead was trying to get away from the, you know, the people who were making him feel worse. And and here it's like, oh, you know, terrible headache. Let me go into an arcade and just, yeah. And, yeah, he uses his scanning abilities on, you know, arcade machines, making them go nuts and eventually explode. And it's just like... Yeah, the the effects team are showing off. It's like, look at what we can do. Like, I legitimately can't figure out why someone... Like, he's apparently hungry because he, like, grabs food from someone else. Which, I mean, I guess that's a reference to the first one. But he's going around... You know, he, he plays this arcade machine. Like... Just, you know, and, and yeah, like, if you know what you're doing and you have the, the resources, you can make, you know, they make the, the, the gun, you know, he, he's supposed to grab, the, you know, it's a, it's one of those arcade machines where you hold on to a joystick that looks and feels like a gun, but he does it with his mind, so it's moving on its own, and it's just, yeah, you know, you just make your, your own thing, and they're, you know, the, the joystick, they're, they're controlling the joystick, it's, yeah. And, yeah, so in the first movie, you know, telepathy was overwhelming for Cameron. And here we have Peter thinking that, you know, thinking that mannequins are speaking to him and, and shouting at them to shut up. Like, I don't even... Does that mean that he's reading minds from outside the room? Why did he set up? Because apparently it was him who set up. Like, they bothered to show us him moving one of the mannequins. So I guess he set up all the mannequins. Because that's that's what the, that's movie shorthand. If we see someone do one thing and we can see it's been done before, that means he's been doing it. Or or at least someone has been, you know. some. But in this case, it must be him because there's nobody else there. And then he starts attacking them, so, which I guess was also... Yeah, yeah, that must also have been, like, affect people showing up. Like, why did he do that if he... Because we later find out he enjoys hurting people, 
So why was he attacking Manic? Oh, wait, is the idea supposed to be that the cops got him to enjoy hurting people before he was satisfied with mannequins, I guess, but he just, they really don't do very much to humanize him in this film, so if that was what they were going for, I gotta say they did not do a good job of communicating it. Um, then we, then, then we have the scene where the, the, I'm gonna try to use the names, yeah, so Dr. Morse and John are discussing uh, yeah, or actually, yeah, yeah. Um, John wanted them to use Peter and Morse, you know, because he, yeah, Peter attacks Morse with his scanning abilities, so Morse uses the drug on him, and John is like, what are you doing? We should, you know, if he might do something, but you don't, if you don't want the doctor using the drug on him why don't you have some guy like have a security guard there to to threaten him so that he do he does what you want him to do or something and just trank peter you know and then when he wakes up you can say if you don't want us to trank you again then don't use the scanning against us you know but no let's give him the drug which was supposed to so so now it now it knocks you out because it because they like take him away after that. In the first, it just made you it just relieved the symptom anyway. Yeah. The first film is full of scanners making decisions based on scanning, and this one is full of scanners making bad decisions despite scan. Like, why did he go into the arcade? Like he's he's like screaming from the headache. And then he goes into an arcade, like, I love arcades, but I also get headaches. I have never in my life thought, oh, headache, this would be a great time to go into an arcade. Like, and I love arcade, like, when I was younger, holy crap, that was, I didn't spend a huge amount of money on it. I saved it as, like, a special occasion, but I really enjoyed when I went, you know, and mostly I would buy the games you could play in arcades, like the House of the Dead movie, uh, games, you know, yeah, I, I have the, let's see, the first three, and the, and the overkill, and the typing of the dead, so, yeah, you know, you, which I, I guess, I don't know if typing can be played in an arcade, I guess that would require a normal keyboard, but, but yeah, you know, so, and then we find out that a scanner is a drug runner, and the movie doesn't attempt to explain. Like, you know, I'm not saying that scanners are angels. That's something that these movies made. You know, both of these movies make clear scanners are capable of doing bad things. But it's like, if if that's, I guess I, I guess more the thing is like, if that is what he does. Uh, wait, is the idea supposed to be that he's always using scanning to? get people to support his drug running. Yeah, I just, like, I, I don't normally say that you need to explain why is a criminal a criminal in a movie, because, you know, there are real-life reasons to be a criminal. But it just seems like scanners in the first movie tend to want to be left alone. Drug running is not going to get you left alone, you know, so just, yeah. And, yeah, like, in general, like, this is not written as well, and that's because good writing is hard. And, let's see, yeah, you know, David explains, ever since I was a kid, I could do things. Oh, no, not things! And the viewers clearly meant to enjoy David killing the robber, you know, the, the... You know, the robber's shown to be sadistic. And it's like, you just saw him use psychic abilities to hurt your, your buddy. Why are you shoving away your your human shit? Like, it makes no sense. Just, and, and you could easily, like, it's, it's, um, it's the girlfriend character, Alice, you know. Alice Leonardo, if she takes just a little bit after her Ninja Turtle counterpart... Presumably, I'm, I'm sorry, I just find it, I find it hilarious that, like, 
Because that was when I when I was like a kid. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, Leonardo, swords. And then I grow up and it's like, oh, yeah, Leonardo, uh, uh, renaissance artist or something like that. You know, I forget if it's renaissance, but, you know, very respected artist. And it's like, I mean, I guess they had to name them something. So the turtles are named after renaissance artists. And like, um, Bebop and Rocksteady, those are kinds of music. Like, I just, I just find it fascinating that, you know, when sitting down to name these characters, that that was how they handled that. Just, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, you know, the robber is shown to be sadistic, where in the first, it was much more ambiguous when people were, were killed, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. And let's be clear, like, David's killing of him is, like, creative, like, he's... You know, he makes this thing grow out of the back of his neck, and then, like, his head explodes. Like, that's a guy who just, oh, you know, when I was a kid, I could do things. He looks like he's been practicing. You know, that's apparently the first time he's killed anyone. So, why is the, the, how is he so good at it? Like, you know, when I was a kid, I could draw a little, but... If I tried to draw today, I wouldn't be able to blow a man's head up with my drawing. And the... Let's see... Yeah, and, and the, you know, John is like, Ah, oh, you know, when you were in the countryside, that's where people have morals and dignity. And here in the city, everything is terrible. And, you know, at the time I thought, Oh, here we go. Here's the moral message of the movie. But later on, like, you know, the thing is, the movie makes it clear that the crime is really bad. Like, and that's the thing. In the first movie, the reason scanners were a problem is because a company favored profits over people. They created a problem, and then they say that it's not their fault. You know, that was interesting. That was much more complex. And here you just have, oh, you know, uh, people are, uh, criminals are bad people, so you have to blow up their heads. You know, later in the movie, it does, you know, it does say that John is going too far, at least. But there's still, like, there is a crime wave. You know, the movie shows over and over that there's horrible criminals. And, yeah, you know, some of the movie is just David going around stopping dangerous criminals. Killing for the cops, which, you know, back then was seen as a good thing. There's no ambiguity, you know, it's not interesting the lead is charismatic, so all these things, unlike the first and more commercial, like, it's much harder to follow a movie, to, to sit down and really be engaged in a movie where the lead is just not charismatic, and we're not even sure he's doing the right thing, like, you know, and, and, yeah, just, uh, let's see, what was the other thing, yeah, because, you know, they're, they're, um, it's an armed robbery, you know, and, and, the, uh, you know, they're, they're taking ho hostages and this whole thing. And then there's that, you know, milk poisoning, which, like, it's mentioned multiple times in other scenes. You know, it's, it's in the papers and everything. So that was, like, it wasn't just a last minute idea kind of, no, they actually, and, and the guy just says, you know, yeah, I didn't get the promotion I wanted, so I poisoned children. It's just, like, what? There, if you don't get the promotion you want, I shouldn't even have to say this, but what he did is completely unacceptable. If you don't get the promotion you want, what you do is you take a piss in the coffee cup. In the coffee... Shit. Uh, I bungled, bungled it. Um, what do they call them? I don't drink coffee. Uh, coffee pot, that's it. Yeah. Did I have you? I might have had at least some of you. I, you might have thought I was going to keep saying something serious there. Um, let's see. Yeah, and, and the, you know, Peter goes in to, to kill uh, the other police chief, I guess. And he said, you know, I have a better idea. I stay here, you stay there. That's the deal, my dear. And yeah, the the 
you know the the John has David go into you know this this um, public I forget what it's called but yeah like you know the the I will briefly say so w yeah when the mayor is about to announce who the next police chief is going to be we don't really get to know the guy but it's like okay that's a guy that the mayor trusts. And then at the end of the movie, he's one of the people who comes in. So, like, it's implied he's, you know, and John confesses. So, okay, this other guy is going to be police chief. And the mayor trusted him, so he is a good guy. Because she seemed to be a good girl, a, a good person. Um, but, yeah, you know, David, you know, John tells David, scan the mayor, you know, read her mind. And David says, that's not right. What do you mean? I mean, you know it works, because it worked perfectly on the milk poisoner. Um, I just, you know, you, you don't tend to fail on those. And then when he does scan the mayor, she says that John is going to be the new police chief. And for the rest of the movie, they act like that was always the plan. And it's like, that wasn't his instruction. I thought... That he was going to read her mind to make sure that she was a good, honest person. But instead, like, like I, I accept, you know, um, if you can read minds, what, what's to stop you from putting something into their mind? It just raises too many questions. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I can, I can, you know, we're disco, that's fine. I can work with that, but... That wasn't what he was told. He was just told, scan them. You know, last time he scanned them, last time he scanned someone, he made them tell the truth. And now he scans someone and they just help the person that he's working for. Like, yeah. Uh, let's see. If Peter is so unreliable... Why is he allowed to talk to David without anyone else that, like, he just, and what's his motivation anyway? He's, they're giving him the drug. What is, why is he rocking the boat? Like, and I, I really resent when movies just write characters as, oh, they're just evil. So they're going to do the evil thing, even if it makes no sense. Like, and, and technically, like, he tells the truth there. So that's, is that evil? And that's, and it's how... Um, that's how David realizes that things are going to... I, I guess... Oh, wait. Oh, he's playing four-dimensional chess. Peter wants David to realize that what they're doing is something David doesn't like so that he'll go against them so that Peter can get revenge on him. I guess. But it's just like... Why would... I, I would never turn my back on someone like Peter. Not for a second. I would never let him... If if I was part of a conspiracy lying to to someone who's that dangerous, I would never wait. The bad guys never actually find out that he's related to Cameron and and um Kim, do they? That's what the parents David's parents know that, and Julie knows that, but the bad guys never actually find out. So they're just kind of incompetent at this whole thing like i just feel because at the end of the day like there still doesn't seem to be that many scanners going out and about like other than the drug you know yeah there's the drug runner and there's like what a dozen people in in hospital beds that are all hooked on the the drug like wasn't there more scanners in the first movie and that was supposed to be the first generation now there's multiple generations and it's just and and i also just Considering how hard of a time Cameron and Kim had, would they really have unprotected sex? I don't know. I just, especially if they can't, ah, I can deal with that later. Especially if they can't be sure that they can keep the, the offspring safe. So just, yeah. And, yeah. Um, David just goes to the research place. He's not authorized to be there. But, uh, yeah, he just, you know, he controls the guy who has to press the button. Why does, why is it just a press of a button? And why is it a guy? They have techno, I don't know if, I don't know if the, 
if, if BJ Nelson writing this realized, but we have a thing called the telephone. And if you pick up the phone, you don't have to be face to face with someone that you're talking to. And hypothetically, if you could mind control people right in front of you, maybe it would be good to use a telephone in order to get access to a top secret facility. Why does he even know where it is? Oh, right. Peter told him where it is. But it's just, it's ridiculous. And, and later we see that the guy does have a gun, but he just doesn't like... It just, like, I, I get that he, the way the scene was done, he couldn't have grabbed the gun before David mind controlled him, but why not just have, like, yeah, yeah, have it, like, uh, let's see, maybe the, the, maybe every time he sees someone, he has to press a button to, to, um, to disengage a security system, you know, before they're allowed in. And he's not actually there. He has, he's just through a telephone. I realize that Cameron learned how to go through a telephone line, but he had to be told that, you know, and if they're smart, they're not going to tell David that because they don't need him to be able to do that. Um, yeah, he just goes in and attacks the doctor and John. And it's like, why is it so easy? Because bad writing. And he even starts using one of their dart guns to attack them. So, like, just... All you had to do was have, like, a thing... Just make it that they have specific dart guns that can only be used... Yeah, maybe maybe they're, like, um, uh, uh, biometric, you know, so fingerprint. You can only press the trigger... If, if the, the fingerprint, and although, otherwise it tears your arm off or something, if you want to go, especially, like, yeah. If you want to go, like, Blade or, or, you know, Judge Dredd with it. But just have it, just, yeah. And, let's see. Um, I promise I won't take forever on this, I just gotta... Really quickly do this. Uh, hmm. Okay. Right. So. And yeah, they they you know mind read Alice to find out where David went. The answer you seek is is rustic, rural even. The farm. And David, you know, he's he's talking to his parents. He's trying to figure out, you know, why, you know, I, I guess they, I guess you knew. And that's why, they, you know, I get straight A's without trying. Then why does he need to cram pathology? This is why you kept me away from the other kids. Okay, does that mean they homeschooled him? Does that mean that he didn't? Scan during class. How does he? If they want him to get an education and they know he can read minds, why are they letting him read their minds for the answers if he's homeschooling? Just, it makes no sense. No matter how you, I would tell you what, if you can, if you can prove that that somehow makes sense, I would love to hear it. Put in the comments, please. Um, yeah, we find out that David is the son of Cam and Kim. And, okay, so David's father realizes that these are bad guys. They're not leaving. So he goes in and starts loading the gun, but he doesn't lock the door? I just, <laughs> it's, it's so, yeah. And, you know, in the first movie, the, you know, basically, yeah, the first thing we see is we're, we're introduced to this weird scanner, you know, and it, we have we don't know anything else. We just see the, the scanning that this movie does the same thing. But, he, you know, in the first, that was the lead. And that was an interesting thing. We're being asked to empathize with someone that at first we, you know, when we just see him eating food off other people's plates and, 
you know, it's not clear at first if he's intentionally doing it, but clearly it is him who's hurting this other, you know, this this woman sitting there. So, you know, it's much more challenging for us to get behind him as, if not the hero, at least the protagonist, the one who drives the story. And here, it's the villain's right hand. And it's also like, after a while, Peter just starts being completely... You know he's he's one hundred percent on board. Like, and I get it. You know, I see. You know, it it shows him still in the car, and we see an empty shot, and he's sitting there like clearly elated. So yeah, they're giving him the drug, but like, weren't they giving him the drug when he told David where to go for the? I guess that was so he could be the the one. But why not? And I guess, how did he know that David would actually care and not just, like, yeah. And and the, um, let's see. Okay, I guess it's, it's a fair point that <clears throat> presumably David would be upset. That he wouldn't won't be want to turn into one of the addicts. So, so that's, but the, um, let's see. Um Yeah, the the Yeah. Um, but, but the, did they not realize that Peter was the one who told him? Who else would have told them? Who else would have told David? Who else knew and would have just, yeah. But you're all I have left. No, David, there is another. And, you know, he talks to, to Julie and asks... What do they want from me? Uh, what do they want with me? And she's like, they want you as a tool. <gasps> no, really? Say it ain't so, Joe. And yeah, so, you know, here near the end, I, you know, I feel like, okay, so the message is, yeah, crime wave, that's bad, but it should not lead to a police state. So I do approve of that. Because, you know, near the end, we finally, you know, he keeps saying, there will be a new order, which is, wasn't that already an ominous phrase in the mid-90s? I feel like, you know, but, but yeah, you know, at least he didn't say new world order, but, you know, he doesn't want the whole world, he just wants the city. And then I guess, is he going to be happy with that, or he's, I, I, you know, he's probably going to go all the way to the presidency, which, you know, if he's controlling people with scanners, he can basically accomplish anything. You know, he can mind control people to vote. You know, if it still matters whether or not people vote or if, you know, Republicans in control will just claim they won anyway. But the, yeah, you know, and that is, um, essentially the same as in the first one, except there it was a scanner who wanted control. It's pretty ridiculous that someone who isn't a scanner and can barely control any of the scanners, thinks that he can gain power by controlling scanners. Just, yeah. And so the... Um, let's see... Yeah, I, I... You know... It wasn't half bad that, you know, David realizes what's going on, so he goes to the mayor and proves to her that he can control, you know, he can make her do things that she doesn't want to do. Not sure why she has smokes, if she doesn't smoke, but whatever. Or did he bring them? Where did he get them? Anyway, because um, we never see him smoke. Anyway, yeah, the, the he goes to the mayor, and he's like, here's the, the you know, if we work together, we can stop John, because he himself doesn't have political power. And then the, the... Uh, I gotta say, I do not recall his name or rank or anything. Um, 
was it maybe um, Guy Gelson, maybe? L yeah, Lieutenant Guy Gelson. You know, he, he's like, up. Oh, I can see them through the window, which is also, like, why do people in movies like this always stand where a window could... Like, if I was him, I would go to her and I would put in her mind, we have to get away from the windows, which proves that, you know, I can make her think certain things and do certain things with my mind. And that would keep us away from the windows, you know, but it's easier to film a sniper scene than, like, I guess they'd have to have, like, a SWAT team breach or something, which, yeah. But, yeah, you know, they, they shoot her, and then, like, you know, he basically has to flee. He can't just, like, explain to someone, no, 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 I didn't blow her head. Oh. Okay, I, I understand how this looks bad. I realize that I am known for blowing people's heads up. This particular head explosion wasn't me. And, uh, yeah, you know, no wonder that he runs. And then, like, Peter shines a light directly in his face. And instead of just, like, backing up a couple of steps... Because, like, at first, you know, there's a couple of meters between him and the car. And they only drive forward very slowly. Why doesn't he just back up so that they can't shine the light? In his, and it's apparently kryptonite. But why, like, they don't... They never use it before or after this scene. Is like... If you know that that's a way to to control a scan, because he isn't able to free himself, you know that's they basically they needed Julie to come save him so that she's back in the movie, even though she said she's never going back. And you know you have this, and I do appreciate. I I love when a woman saves a man in a movie, but it just felt so forced. Like it's, and I guess it's because he's been running away from guns. So when the the um, ah, what's the word? Um, yeah, you know he's he's been running away from people firing guns at him. So if Peter just had a, a gun pointed at him, you know it'd be like, well, why is this gun stopping him when he, you know none of the others did? And you know, okay, so this time the the you know, they don't right away. Yeah, actually, yeah, they end up doing... Wow. Okay, so before they go and the... Um, before... I forgot his name. Uh, David. Before David and Julie just go into the lab... You know, he's been there several times uh, by, you know, they would, it would at least be his, yeah, yeah, because that was where they tested him earlier. You know, this would only be his second unauthorized, uh, you know, entrance. This time, they, I don't know why it's necessary for both of them, but I get, oh, so, so you don't have to have one of them telling the other what they're seeing. But, but yeah, so they can together read a third mind so that both of them can see what that person can see and yeah you know they're still not really they're they're not even slowed down you know even though the guard is like you're being pretty weird it's just like if one of these guards passed along the message dude's being weird you know that would actually but but no he just he walks right up and they're like you're being weird and he's like yes and you know moves along so, yeah, it just... I do not understand why they thought this, you know... Yeah. I worry that BJ... I'm just going to really quickly check. Because he did... Yeah, he wrote the sequel. as He wrote the third movie as well. I am very worried that the writing is going to be equally as bad. Because he must have written them at the same time, since they came out the same year. But yeah, you know, the, the climax isn't half bad. Um, you know, you have two scanners going into a place that has a third scanner, and they're fighting each other. Yeah. And, you know, the... the uh, let's see... Um... Oh, right, yeah, yeah, Julie gets darted, and David 
spins the guard right, right round like a record baby. I didn't know records had babies. That's, you know, you learn something new every day from 80s music. And, you know, David goes into the attic and tells them, just say no. I'm, I'm slightly kidding there, but, like, I don't even... Did they need a pep talk? Were they happy being there? Because I didn't think they were happy being there. But, you know, it's the 90s. We gotta have our, you know, war on drugs messaging. So it's just... Yeah. And... Let's see. Yeah, and here at the end, we finally have some scanner versus scanner action instead of non-scanners fighting scan you know because the drug deal the drug dealing scanner was shot not scanned so yeah but yeah um the death of peter is legitimately satisfying i'm not gonna lie i do think that him telling peter to, peter telling david i killed your mother like you didn't need to make him more evil and more easy to kill that was completely gratuitous like it's, there's absolutely no reason i and i guess it's just because like bj nelson if he was writing this you know from from start to finish he got near the end he's like oh wait i gotta make it personal as if it wasn't already personal you know he's they've hated each other since or peter has hated david since their f first meeting and i do appreciate you know he's like i'm gonna make you pay pretty boy and later you know he does so that's yeah and I appreciate that, you know, early in the film we see guns stop the, the drug running scanner so we know that it is possible to stop a scanner even though it never happens again. But yeah, you know, so that establishes, uh, you know, yeah, some scanners are, are criminals and they are being stopped by guns. But obviously it's easier if you also have scanners. And yeah, you know, some of the best effects of the movie and... For sure, the most satisfying deaths are the villains here at the end. I really appreciate it. You know, the, they mess Peter up. And the there's the other... Uh, John also gets messed... You know... Yeah. I really don't know why... Okay, so... I guess someone realized... Oh, wait. Um... Alice is supposed to be, like, a major character, and she hasn't really done that you know so she she you know throws some some hot soup in the cop's face which i mean does he know that they're corrupt is there some chance that he's just doing his job and not anyway and then she you know yeah she gets away and she like when when he's talking to the press you know she's like so what about this and that and you know she's doing his job but then apparently she's surprised when he asks to have her arrest like why did you do if you don't want to risk arrest you know because because she's not like yeah fine arrest me she's like oh no he's gonna arrest you know just do any of the characters in this movie realize that they can make logical choices they don't have to make a bad choice just so that the movie because that's the thing at the end of the day like For a movie to happen, you have to have characters making choices. They, you know, you know, someone is making choices or we're watching something with no choice being made. But most of the time, movies have choices being made and it is significantly more difficult if you make characters smart and make smart choices instead of their choices being these really stupid just to keep the movie going kind of thing. But yeah, you know... I gotta say, not looking great for writer B.J. Nelson, and I don't see myself seeking out their work. I guess I don't know for sure if it's, you know, the their gender. Anyway, that brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. So, yeah, uh... I've heard that the, the third movie is super weird, so I'm a little bit looking forward to that, but I've also heard it's bad and illogical, so I'm not looking forward to that. And I really, you know, so far, I don't think this movie makes a strong case that there needed to be more than one 
um, movie about scanners. You know, just like I get, you know, it's it's I can actually just go watch the X Men movies and have good movies that are based on you know superpowers. But and and you know back. You know, this was even before the Saturday morning cartoon show, which I want to say started in 97. So, you know, I understand that, but nevertheless, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't have very many critic quotes for this section. Just the same film again, just worse. And, yeah, that's, yeah, it, it really is. Like, I, if you didn't have a different idea, like, basically the difference here is that it's the police force rather than a corporation and the guy who wants power isn't a scanner himself like that's that's it you know so i suppose you could say that it's critical of uh, police and that i do appreciate and that was uh, certainly something there's there's a little bit to be fair the movie has a little bit of pushback against the war on crime and you know Everybody hates crime, not t disputing that, but the, the way that it was handled in the 90s, the um, street, three strikes law, for example, you know, that was just, you know, sure, it made people feel good. It made them feel like, ah, we're doing something. But, you know, now we have the data, it did not help. And, and honestly, if at the time, if you could reason with the people who were just convinced that they themselves are going to be victimized you know then senator now president joe biden did say you know i can imagine my family being attacked so i don't care about how it happened okay so you're saying you don't want to prevent it because you're saying you just want to punish it you just want retributive justice and nothing else just like i get look it's easy to hate people who do bad things. It is much more difficult and much more constructive in the long run if we try to understand how it happened. Let's see. And, yeah, um, at least one critic describes Raul Trujillo playing Peter Drag as an evil vagrant when the first movie was in part about empathy for the unhoused and just, yeah, really, really hated that. Um, right, the very ending has the lead scanner tell the world not to worry, you know, we mean you no harm, but, you know, a bunch of people just saw you do some of the worst in the entire movie, we will never do anything horrifying. Again, after this point, I mean, uh, can I have a mulligan? I realize that makes it more dramatic, but a quick rewrite and you could have the scanners keep secret what they do. Just make, you know, have them make sure they do it behind a closed door where no one can see. You could even have a line of dialogue where one of them says, if regular people see this, they'll never trust, you know, just, just have David attack John, you know, yeah, first have, have John, you know, confess, and then he grabs a weapon and like, ah, crap, yeah, you gotta, you gotta rewrite this scene a little bit more. Okay, yeah, yeah, um, let's see. Obviously the confession. It's good to have that uh, somewhat publicly. Um, let's see. But the messing up of the face. Yeah, I guess at the end of the... Oh, wait, yeah, yeah. Um, have it be that they make him confess without anyone realizing that he's being made to confess. They think he just had a sudden change of heart. You know, maybe it's one of those 24-hour bugs that make people tell the truth. Those are going around. But... Then, like, maybe they, you know, start to, let's see. Yeah, yeah, he grabs a gun, points it at all the people, and backs away. And then, you know, David and Julie manage to, you know, yeah, he goes through a door. And David and Julie attack him. Julie wrestles the gun away, run, you know, and, ah, uh, let's see. I don't want it to be David's idea. Yeah, yeah. Julie, you know, yeah, she grabs the gun and she goes over towards the door that they just, that, that John just came through. And David's like, what are you doing? Because this movie's full of people asking stupid questions like that. And so she blocks the door with the gun. It's, it's one of those that have the handles that you can block with a, a long object, you know. 
and then yeah so she, she blocks the door and then she says if people see what we can do they'll never trust us that kind of thing you know and so they you know yeah they maybe even they they give john one final chance to surrender and he tries to attack and maybe let's yeah let's go for the full he tells them that he's the one who killed their father and then they mess his face up like that and maybe yeah maybe have like the head blow up at the end also and it just looks yeah yeah and they they come out and they're like Oh, you gotta come see this. John blew his own head off with this shotgun. You know, just... I came up with most of that off the top of my head. So, let's see. So, so yeah, you know, basically we have here a movie that thinks that you can start with more or less right intentions and end up abusing your power if you are a cop. You know, there are good cops in this movie... The movie clearly, you know, it's clearly supposed to be a good thing that the mayor's real candidate for police chief comes there at the end. Uh, let's see. I guess... Right, and yeah, where the first movie opens with the protagonist completely devastated by his out-of-control powers. In this one, he just gets some really bad headaches sometimes but he has his life so much together that he's training to become a veter veterinarian rather than unhoused like in the first one this would be perfectly fine if they properly addressed it in the movie just have it be that he knew about his powers he had access to the drug that calms it down but in both cases the first time we see the lead use scanning abilities is clear he doesn't really understand the nature of it now this movie tries to address it by saying that only what was it only a did they say virgin mind or am I, it, it was something like un, untouched, undisturbed mind or something, you know, let's see. And yeah, you know, once he moved to the city, if he still lived in the countryside, then, you know, there wouldn't be so many minds that he was overwhelmed. I get he might not be overwhelmed, but would still be able to read the thoughts of people close to him which should have more of an impact on him than it does. In the first, it is critical that the lead gets the medication for his condition, where in this, he's specifically told not to take it. Where the first one has corporate espionage, this one is just working for the police to stop crimes. And before you say that Minority Report made an excellent short story and a passable movie, you're absolutely right, but a big part of the appeal of both of those is the exploration of the ethical issues that are brought up, and this movie does not do that. This movie has a lame anti-drugs message. You know, this was... Yeah, the war on crime, I mean, is still ongoing, but during this time was, you know, supposedly the drug that helps them is addictive. Not all medicine is addictive. The first movie was in part about how some unhoused individuals just need proper medical attention. And that was, you know, that still is, but, you know, especially back then, there was, there was no empathy for the unhoused, you know. And, yeah, here this one comes and just... If they just made it that, actually, yeah, again, off the top of my head, I swear I didn't write this down in my notes or anything, make it that there's a new drug that enhances their power, but is addictive. There you go. You could still have that the old drug, you know, has that effect, and the, the you know, because the drugs that you really don't want to get addicted to and that can be extremely addictive are the ones that, you know, make you feel good, you know, but they're, like, if, if the, the, um, let's see, you know, and it's just, it, I find it so boring when the villain is a drug addict, and then there at the end, it doesn't even matter that Peter is a drug addict, like, it doesn't come into play near the end at all, and he was already a good little soldier for them before, Back when David was... Yeah, I get... I mean, it must be that he wanted to get rid of David so that they would have to rely on him. But why was he free to move around and so that he would be able to tell David that? And again, you could just make it... You have characters that can read minds in this movie. Just have it be that he manages to get... The, to put that into David's mind. Then David goes and investigates. But no, it has to be the stupid way, because this is a stupid movie. 
Um, I think that was everything that I had to say. But but yeah, you know, the, the fact that, look, I get it. The opioid crisis is real. It is an actual problem. But, and, and you know, it, it, yeah, for a lot of people, it started with them just being prescribed drug, uh, uh, painkillers, that's it. Drug killers? Was I going to say drug killers? Um, I may not have gotten enough sleep last night. Um, but yeah, just have it be that they have a new drug and they, yeah, because John is, you know, like, oh, we got to get this under control. He could easily be like, I, you know, I demand that we, we make them stronger. And so the, the doctor, you know, produces this drug that it, you know, it's definitely, I'm sure it'll, enhan it'll enhance their abilities, but we haven't tested it yet. Oh, actually, wait, is the third one, does the, that one have test, it hasn't been tested, so there's side effects. So, so yeah, you know, obviously BJ couldn't use that two movies in a row. If he's going to write a movie that's exactly the same as the movie before it, obviously it has to be when he didn't write the first movie. So, yeah. So... If you have a passionate defense of this movie, please put it in the comments. I'll be happy to debate it. Um, yeah, I hope this was as much fun for you as it was for me. has been a while since I did a more ranty video, but this movie gave me a lot to work with. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it's an evil scanner. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler filled thoughts on the most recent episode of the 2022 Willow show. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you more of a... If you want more, ah, I was, it was doing so well too. If you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. That was it for my video on the second movie about fax machines. Ah, dial-up modems. Ah, landline phones. Scanners. Bye.